Okay, today is Saturday. We're on our way to the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology in downtown Albuquerque. Well, not exactly downtown, it's in the museum area. Um, there's kind of different areas of Albuquerque. There's a downtown, there's an old town, there's the museum area. And they're kind of all pretty close to each other. Um, unless you're walking. Unless you're walking, that's good. So it's right on the, let's see, that would be the eastern edge. Do I have that right? Probably not. Of the University of New Mexico, my alma mater. Western. Um, pardon me? Western. Is it Western? Okay. I, you know how I am with my I directions. Think so. um, and uh, we're looking forward to the visit. We haven't been to a Museum of Anthropology since we went to the Museum of Anthropology at uh, Ghost one Ranch. Half mile, turn right. Ghost Ranch, as Shelley said before she was interrupted by our guide. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. And also I want to spend a little time talking about the difference between differences between anthropology and uh, archaeology uh, because there are differences and I think this particular museum uh, highlights you know what the differences are. So we'll see how it goes. It'll be a lot of fun. It's very close for us. Thanks guys. arrived at the museum. It is on the west side of uh, UNM and there's a little parking lot that you have to get a permit for, which Toby ran inside. Got the permit, ran back out. He was just a jogging. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the permit. You have to go in and get one. It's free, although they do accept donations. I did get a chance to speak with a couple of people that were in the, uh, the gift shop. Right now, the gift shop is having a 20% off sale, a Valentine's 20% off sale. You put that on your dashboard. I did find out two things. I always question when you're in a place like this, wh how we can use photo, whether we can use flash, whether we can make video. And what they said to us is that we can video or photo anything on the first level, which is their open exhibits. They do have a second level that you have access to but they don't like you to use flash because there's pottery and uh, paintings up there that the flash, uh, the impression is that flash is going to uh, shorten its life. But they also said I could make video up there because they have some burial pots. And so that tends to be on the sensitive side in terms of uh, the ancient Puebloans and uh, tribal culture. So um, I, we are going to, you know, do what they ask us to do and not make a video up there. So this could be a relatively short video if we're only going to be on the lower level, but I'm sure you guys would be okay with it. This is an outstanding museum of anthropology and it deserves to be seen uh, even if we can't see, even if we can't put all of it on video. If you get here, you'll have access to the second floor and see some of the more, um, what I'd call, sensitive materials. Okay, so here we go. Off we go. Thanks, guys. And the Maxwell Museum of anthropology. And their special event. Dun, dun, dun. There's the front of the building. So you park at the side. And there's the sign. The anthropology Maxwell Museum, UNM. 500 University Boulevard Northeast. And that's the campus. What building is that one? There's no sign on it. Oh, there it is. Bandelier Hall West. That's what that is. All right. That's some, you know, Puebloan architecture here. A little place to sit and have coffee or snack.
see what else is going on. Valentine Day sale. The UNM Maxwell Museum of Anthropology open Tuesday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Let's see, we got 20% off chocolate jewelry, fetishes, and more. Professor Ian Wallace of the Department of Anthropology will be doing an annual ancestors lecture. Are you talking February to both your cameras? 6.30 p.m. Here comes Toby. All right. Got in the right parking place. The gentleman was very helpful. So let's give you a quick uh, tour. This is uh, western edge of the University of New Mexico, uh, my alma mater. A lot of the buildings have this Spanish style, the New Mexican style. So, and we're at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. And if you're going to come here and you're not a student, come on a Saturday. Uh, because during the weekdays uh, and the school year, this campus is just busy. Although they do have uh, free parking here, and that's the other thing about UNM, is uh, they enforce their parking regulations with a vehemence. 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 It's All right, we're learning about baskets. Oh, that's very Ansel Adams. He must have studied David Grant Noble. All right, so the lighting uh, is going to make some of our footage a little bit shaky just because it'll be low levels, but we'll do the best that we can. So, hi again. Hi again. That way? Yeah. All right. Welcome over here. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so we're going to go through our tour first, and mm -hmm. then we'll stop at the uh, gift shop afterwards. Uh, because they're having a 20% off sale. And why wouldn't you? On some things. So it's, uh, I'm going to call this very subtle lighting, guys. So if the film, if the video looks shaky to you, that's why. So the University of New Mexico um, has both a great anthropo anthropology program and a great archaeology program. And I'm sure when given the opportunity to get to uh, work together. So let's talk about that a little bit. That's, oh, that's interesting. So that's an image of Chaco Canyon. And this is an image of what? Mm, some horseshoe Looks building. like they, they, well, they built it in the style of Chaco. Uh-huh. Which is kind of neat. So I'm going to express my opinion on the matter, the differences between anthropology and archaeology. Anthropology is the study of cultures or the study of people in the context of their culture. Archaeology is the study of things that the people left behind. So this is there's a, a lot of crossover. Model some of, that. of what they do at different ruins. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, a lot of crossover in their work. They not only work together, but I know of instances where famous anthropologists became famous archaeologists as well. These are field notes. The earliest architectural form in the southwest is the pit house, a single room dwelling partially excavated into the ground. Early pit house settlements circa AD 200 to 750 consist of one or more pit houses, whereas later settlements circa AD 750 to 900 have pit houses and associated rows of surface rooms. Pit houses were all-purpose structures 
in that people conducted a wide range of activities within them, from preparing food and making tools to sleeping. So this is what it looks like when they excavate a pit house. And they even have like the layers of discernible layers there. Hang on, play. As Shelley says, I'm playing with my camera. This is a wonderful example of, so this is interesting because to me, this is archaeological work. So what is this a recreation of? Because this says, this charred stump is all that remains of a wooden post that helped to support the roof of the pit house. Mm -hmm. The post must have caught fire before the pit house was filled with sand and rubbish, probably at the same time that the layers of charcoal and ash on the pit house floor was produced. A logical interpretation would be that part of the pit house burned and the structure was never reoccupied. Mm -hmm. So what what's is, the question? Is this a specific place then that we're looking? Uh, it's certainly, I'm going to guess it's an it's example. It's a reconstruction of an archaeological site in New Mexico. At the upper left is a portion of a room from a large stone pueblo that dates to around AD 1050. On the lower right is a roundhouse or a pit house dating to about uh, AD 850. The earlier pit house is separated from the later Pueblo room by layers of sand and rubbish. This reconstruction is an example of how archaeological sites commonly look when they are being excavated. The difficult task for the archaeologist is to interpret what these structures were like when people lived in them. Hmm. Well, again, the interesting thing is we're in a museum of anthropology, not archaeology, but it's obvious that there's a certain They're amount of together. crossover yeah. between the two. And I know, they, I know for certain they work together. She used the natural plaster and pigment, so it actually has the benefit of the cracks in there. Frescoes were painted on interior walls of kivas and ceremonial houses for healing and prayer. She uses cultivated earth and ash for the plaster. Her pigments come from the mesas, arroyos, and different parts of the land. So if the larger of the two is 1150, that's about the time that Chaco Canyon was thriving and these walls look like the thick walls of Chaco. The pit houses came later around AD or B. BC, common area? Wait, AD, before, 750. Oh. So that stamp there is the stamp that identifies or provides identifying information about the dig. And then they're stamped onto those labels there. And then those labels are tied onto different things. and they bring artists with them to make detailed sketches of all the material. And what's funny, well, I don't know if it's funny necessarily, but they still bring sketch artists with them in addition to making photographs and videography.
So see, these are all the things that you would discover as a part of an archeological dig, documenting them. And then you would turn them over to the anthropologists to use in determining more about the people and the culture. So some samples of animal bone, their ceramics or pottery, flaked stone, or the way they uh, cut stone and used it to make tools and weapons and other goods. A grinding stone to take and grind the corn into meal so that you can make different things from that. So I think this is our upstairs exhibit that we can't record. And I'm going to suggest that the lighting is probably, but they do have a downstairs here part two. So we'll go here. samples of different skulls. Australopithecus, which goes back three million years. Homo habilis, which goes back two million years. Early Homo erectus, that was ours, that's where we come from. 900,000 years and Oh no, yeah, 900 million years. No, that's not right. And then us today. Nope, I'm sorry, that's Homo Neanderthal. <laughs> Neanderthal. Ensis. Neanderthal Ensis. And this is an example of us today, directly at the University of New Mexico. So this is the brain, the skull of a small child, the tongue child, found in Tongue, South Africa. And then this is our modern brain in a brain case. Examples, I don't know if you'd see it with a glare, but modern human brain and chimpanzee brain. So this is a display of Ice Age art. In Spain, mostly in Europe. I've seen samples of the work that was made in the caves in France. There are the French Pyrenees. So here's an example. So this is to me is anthropology, objects and what they tell us. This is about the, the, the people, right? During the upper Paleolithic human burial, often rich in grave goods, became relatively abundant in Central and Southwestern Europe. That's a transition when you start burying your dead. From uh, them, we have learned that people wore decorated fur and hide clothing sewn with bone needles. They also made personal ornaments such as necklaces, pendants, etc. So anthropologists are taking the material that comes from a dig site and interpreting it to tell us more about the people themselves. So 
So I remember once in an introductory art class at the Corcoran uh, School of Art and Design at George Washington University, which is where I graduated from, we were told one of our assignments was uh, to find an example of cave art and convert it into what a how a modern human would have painted that. And that was a really fun exercise. Oh, this is their version of mobile art, things that they could take with them and not have to leave in the caves. So it was like these. So we, we were assigned to pick an example of this kind of cave art. And I, I think it was, we could use colors if we wanted. We had to start with a, either a graphite sketch or a charcoal sketch. Graphite is just pencil. And, um, and pick that sample and put it on a piece of art paper and then do our modern interpretation of that sample. Uh, and the idea was to avoid basically just copying it, do your interpretation. So we knew this was an interpretation of the Chinese horse. And so you had to draw your, your from your imagination, uh, the horse on the background, you know. So mobile art objects included the human form, and that was, she was the equivalent of a goddess. Uh, and the idea was to bless you with many children because that's how the species survived. Or to rub on it. <laughs> or to rub when on it. When she was away. <laughs> Oh, this is such a good example. It's a, a really good example of cave art, and they just replicated it to a certain extent. I wonder if they recruited their art students to do that. So this display is all about eating and chewing and how it developed for us. So that represents the modern chimpanzee. This is Australopithecus afarensis, early humans. And they're showing you examples of the musculature that was developed in order for us to chew. We have the least amount because uh, our food is so refined. Too many smoothies. <laughs> Too many smoothies. Yeah, we don't have to be creative when it comes to chewing. Because when you think about it, what kind of a flat face. And getting dressed was less important than getting food. <laughs> but by that time, we had developed the stereoscopic eyesight, the use of the opposable thumb, hair on our bodies to keep us warm, and a pretty good sized brain cavity, I think. Yeah. So that was us two and a half million years ago. Got some big hands.
So these are all examples of how the opposable thumb gives us additional capabilities that we wouldn't otherwise have. So the human hand has a total of 22, 27 bones in it. It's a chimpanzee hand. The astro, astral opithecus afarensis. I'm going to have to practice these. That's Homo habilis, handyman, right? Mm -hmm. Homo, I'm just going to say Neanderthal, and us, the modern human hand. So look at how long our thumb bone got as a result of all that use. And these are the samples of tools. That they made. Hi there. Good. How's it going? So far so good. We're having a good time. I'm glad. It's a lot of information, you know? Yeah. Welcome. So this is a Neanderthal. Look at how big his hands were in comparison. Mm -hmm. Much broader shoulders, much healthier, opposable thumbs, still hairy, but starting to wear clothing. Well, I think a lot of men are that hairy nowadays, especially if they're of, uh, you know. Northern European. Well, even like Italian, Sardinian. Mm -hmm. Look, look at uh, Macron, the French president. Yeah. Wow. He's hairier than this guy. Yeah, he is. I used to have a client. Uh, he was the head of a research company. And you couldn't tell where his chest hair ended and where his beard began, you know. He's got some little hands. So this is 5 million to 2.5. So this is er way early us. This is from where we developed. And I'm going to guess he's about, what, four feet tall? Mm -hmm. Life-size reconstruction of a young adult female. Lucy. Oh, is that Lucy? Mm-hmm. So that was, Lucy was found. The on which the statue is based is Lucy. So Lucy wasn't quite the missing link, but she was the first discovery that gave us the earliest connection between a standing uh, biped and us. Go ahead, you do it. I'll get it. All right. How has bipedalism changed us? How are the positions of the head different between apes and humans? Oh, it's lighting up on the screen. Do it again. Oh, just while I'm holding it? Mm -hmm. The head in apes is the vertebral column is more horizontal and the head projects in front of it, which we tend to do when we're in front of the computer way too much in our mm -hmm. lifetime. <laughs> on humans, the head is balanced on top of the upright vertebral column. How does the human pelvis differ from the ape pelvis in shape and position? Let's see. The climbing hip in apes and other quadrupedal mammals the long and narrow pelvis does not provide side-to-side -side balance. The hip muscles, the gluteals, move the leg backward by extending the hip around an axis of rotation from side to side. Since apes use their legs chiefly for climbing, their climbing hips give them considerable power for moving around in the trees, and quite quickly, in fact. Change hands with your camera, so you don't have to do the cross. Uh, the walking hip, that's in humans. The blades of the pelvis are oriented to the side, which places the gluteal muscles where they can effectively balance the trunk over the leg that must support the entire body, while the other leg is thrust forward during locomotion. The 
gluteal muscles move the leg to the side around an axis of rotation from front to back because we support our weight on one leg 95% of the time while walking our walking hips keep our bodies from falling in the unsupported to the unsupported side. That's an interesting thought, huh? More important are thighs, thigh bones, angle in from the hip to the knee, raising our center of gravity above the knees and eliminating the need to Can't read it. Waddle, waddle when we walk. Waddle. We don't want to waddle. Waddle, waddle, waddle. Unless you're, <clears throat> unless you're a speed walker. <laughs> <clears throat> Which skeleton has a knee that can fully straighten? Looks like us. They have a client. The apes have a climbing knee. Since apes use their legs mostly for climbing, they have knees that provide them with power through all positions of knee flexion. The surfaces of their knee joints are round, providing even, even movement of the knee in all positions. So the walking knee, humans have knees that can fully straighten, enabling us to stand for long periods of time without tiring, the thigh muscles, the quadriceps. Uh -oh. Humans have knees that can fully straighten, enabling us to stand for long periods of time without tiring the thigh muscles, the quadriceps, which straighten the leg at the knee. In addition, our knees operate most effectively when they are relatively straight, bent less than 20 degrees. This difference is reflected in our flatter or more elliptical knee joints. It makes us good walkers, but poor Climbers. Mm -hmm. Although I've seen some people that do some pretty good climbing. What they say over there, ooh, this is a real complex down there. That's about the feet. Climbing feet. Walking feet. So apes are made for climbing and people are made for walking. These people are made for walking and that's just what they'll do. It looks like a human fossil, doesn't it? A Neanderthal burial. A young man from Cabra Cave. I'm just going to read the top. Yeah, Mount Carmel, on the north coast of Israel. So one of the great things about both anthropology and archaeology is that when a discovery is made, they make casts, and so this is not the original, this is a, a cast made from the original discovery, which was where? On the coast Kibera? of Israel, in Mount Carmel, on the north coast of Israel. So the research and what helps anthropology is the combination of the fossils, the sites themselves, and or comparing it to the present. It's a human family. So this tells us what makes modern humans unique. So the first thing, of course, is that we're bipedal, we're walkers. 
bipedal locomotion, terrestrial locomotion, modest length, strength, and speed. We can use tools. We know how to use tools. We have the mobile thumb and hafting. And, and hafting is the art of combining uh, different kinds of materials into tools and weapons. So an arrow is hafted because it has uh, a point made from stone and a shaft made from wood. Eating. Oh, this is cute. So we have the right teeth, basically. We have short faces, small cheek teeth, and lightly built faces. So we don't get in our own way to eat. We have larger brains, and we have language with which to communicate. We think. And good examples of the point at which that changed was when we started seeing art and personal decoration. And then, of course, there's our spread from Africa, from pretty much the center of Africa, out to where all humans are today. So these are our ancestors, the apes, the Australopithecus, and the Homo all the way through Homo sapiens. And that process took millions of years. So I think this is ancestors. Hi there. Is this a, a temporary exhibit? Baskets? I'm not too sure because like your security. Like well, let me. In there, in there, uh, oh, I see. So this is, uh, I'm going to call it a temporary exhibit that has to do with basket weaving, but all the things that were created as a result of the skill. These examples are from their collection. Yeah. It may see, seem surprising to see a 24-foot-long canoe in an exhibit about baskets. But if the basket could be defined as a container for holding and carrying things, then this canoe, made on a frame of cedar or spruce and wrapped in the flexible, flexible bark of paper perch to hold and carry people, and their possessions easily meets that definition. So a canoe is just a big people carrying basket. Carried by the water. Mm -hmm. So these are some locally, local basket weavers who mostly are uh, famous throughout the world and some of their work. Madeline Tosa of Hemes. Julie M. Oyinki from O.K. Owenge, north of Española. And Christopher Lewis. It's a beautiful work.
probably just supplies for pine displays Pardon? together. It's probably just supplies for pine mm -hmm. displays together. So that book over there matches the numbers of the displays. So mm -hmm. they have explanations. So these look like materials. And the rest are results. This exhibit, oh, this exhibition celebrates Native North American basketry traditions as seen through the collection in the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. On display are finished objects, works of artistry, complexity, beauty, and use. Behind each basket is a deeper story. Their stories connect us to the people who made them, the lands on which they were made, and the material from which they were constructed. Each basket is embedded with profound seasonal knowledge and long-standing commitments to nature and the protection of land for future generations. What does it say about five? About what? Five. That's it. I would have to put my glasses on. Oh, you want me to do it? Here, I'll read. I have my glasses on. I'll just read the intro. <clears throat> Oops, that's four. Let's go over here. So object 10 is a whaler's hat from Washington State, the Nootka tribe. And object of the living is a birch bark container, North uh, Alaskan Yukon, early mid 20th century. Case six is a wedding plaque. It's Hopi from Arizona. Seven. Seven is a basket for a balloon, but a really small one. <laughs> oh, it does look like that, doesn't it? It's a basket, Choctaw, Southeast United States, 20th century. That's a winnowing basket, Karuk or Olequa, Yurok, California, around 1900. So you have to come and see the rest for yourself. We'll just give you the little tour. So this subtle lighting, the subtle lighting is designed for viewing these things. It's not designed for either photography or videography, so you're gonna to have to bear with us. I'm sure some of this is going to come out a little bit shaky because right now my ISO is 4990. It goes up to 6400, so we're peaking. So what I was reading from is this right here, which gives a really good explanation of each of the... Uh, exhibits and also apparently if you shoot your phone at that you can get the same explanation on your phone maybe i'll do it just to have it i wonder if it'll download onto my phone well, i suppose it's just their website so you yeah. can just go to their website so You know, I feel like we have to come back to these things and not, not for the purpose of making video, but for the purpose of taking advantage of all this, don't you think? I'm 
I'll make sure I get that before I leave. All right, guys, so um, I'll walk you through the remainder of the basket exhibit. And then let's go and get a shot of the gift shop. Okay. And then we'll turn things off and go upstairs just to go upstairs, we think. How come your front camera is a 16 by 9? I don't know. That's, you gave it to me. I didn't do anything. Hmm. I just don't know how it got there. I'm going to have to... Mine isn't, so... I don't know. I know, I know. I just turned it on. I, turn I'm it not off. accusing you of anything. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, if you guys are even upstairs? Uh, we haven't. We're going to turn off the cameras and go. Okay. I just thought I'd let you know. Yeah. Thank you. They let us know when we came in. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you a quick walk through the um, gift shop so you guys can see what they have. Uh, it's a very nice collection from uh, pottery to baskets. Two fetishes. Jewelry. Books. Oh, nice collection of books. More jewelry, imagery. Some right. geology samples. I don't think they're for sale. Are they? <laughs> okay, here's the plan. Uh, we can't use cameras on the upper level, so we're going to go. Uh, we're going to turn off our cameras. We're going to go up to the upper level. We'll stop by the gift shop to pick something up on the way out, and then we'll do an outro outside uh, just before we get back into the truck. Okay? Okay. So as you come downstairs from upstairs, uh, you're led into this photographic exhibit in black and white. It is an exhibit by... David Grant Noble. Where do you see it? Right here. Oh. Uh, done in black and white, and it looks... Uh, I'm going to turn around here because it starts over there. Mm -hmm. So his images have kind of an Ansel Adams look to it. So he studied the zone system. And it looks like his objective is to capture some of the Puebloan and ancient Puebloan architecture. Keeps. Canyon de Chez and Mummy Cave and some Cheeps. Ancestral Puebloan, Chaco and Chacoan cultures, along with images of pictographs. Canyon de Chez, that's the White House. Pueblo Bonito, that's a Chaco Canyon. That's also Chaco Canyon, that's one of the bigger ruins. Northwest Arizona, didn't even know that was there. On 
the Rio Puerco Valley. We go by that all the time on our way down to Socorro. That's Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument. Bandelier. Those are the cave dwellings at Bandelier up near Los Alamos where we were last week. That's a beautiful collection. Okay, let's go outside and do an outro, then I'll come back and take pictures. Okay. Well, that was the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology at the UNM campus, and uh, it's free to uh, take a look at, so make sure you stop by if you're in Albuquerque. Give yourself, if you have any interest whatsoever in the cultures of the Southwest, give yourself, especially the Native American cultures, uh, give yourself a good, it's open from 10 to 4. You can use all of it if you decide to uh, look at it in detail. There's much information here. You have access to the first floor, you have access to the second floor, and uh, although you can't shoot any imagery up there, I strongly recommend you get to the uh, second floor, especially if you have an interest in the evolution of Pueblo and culture, because that's where a lot of that information stands. But everything else is very informative, very complete. Uh, the exhibit of basket weaving is very good, and the folk photographs the work of David Gibson? Nolan. Nolan. Or Gibson. I don't know. Whatever Nolan the guy said, whatever his name was. Is, uh, is worth viewing, Dave, especially, call him. If you, especially if you're, uh, you know, a black and white photographer and you enjoy not only looking at black and white photography, but shooting it. So that's it for today's trip. We're actually going to go back in and take some photos um, of some of the uh, labels and things like that so that we have the uh, pictures as well. Anything else? We might be going somewhere else, and we'll let you know. Uh, yeah, we're going to go on probably to, um, what's it called? Sawmill, sawmill the sawmill district. area. And we're going to go visit Mama's Minerals, which is the uh, a local mineral plush shop. They have jewelry and minerals and all kinds of stuff. So I don't know if we'll shoot anything there, but we're on our way there. Okay? Okay. Here we all right. So Shelly's back in the truck already. We're, this is the parking lot for the museum. It's on the west side of the museum. You actually have to go around to that direction to gain entry. This is a stop sign that's an exit at the exit to the museum. And inside of there, on a magnet, I don't know if you can see it, I've hidden uh, Mariah's cash coin. So if you find yourself in this, uh, in this area, see if you can find the coin.